Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 17th chapter. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The gospel, the good news of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. I invite you to be seated. Connor, do you mind going to the next slide, please? So before I start to share my thoughts um, in the sermon form this morning, I wanted to put an image in front of you for you to uh, gaze upon while you listen to me talk for the next 25 minutes. Um, this is an illumination um, from the St. John's Bible. And I haven't talked a whole lot about that here. But the St. John's Bible uh, was commissioned by the Benedictine Monastery in St. Cloud, Minnesota for the millennium, for the year 2000. It was a project that took 14 years to complete and about $12 million dollars. And it was a new translation of the Bible um, that included original art, these illuminations. And the illuminations were done in Wales by 11 artists who were there under the guidance of Donald Jackson. So the monks in, in uh, Minnesota would send their thoughts to the artists and they would put them into art. And illumination is a fancy word. It means the way light reflects off of precious metal. And in the original of this, which is in uh, Minnesota, in, at, at St. John's, on display, you can see a lot of gold, a lot of gold leaf, and the, and the light dances off of this. So I would invite you to just let your eyes kind of move around this while I'm talking a little bit about this Feast of the Transfiguration. Okay? So I wanted to ask you, if you've ever had this experience, maybe it's back when you were in high school, maybe something more recent than that, when you were a part of a team or part of a group, and you found yourself in the groove with your team. You had been building community, practicing together. Your goals were clear. You were starting to really gel. Things were coming together. People's talents and gifts were being lifted up. And the, the team was really starting to move forward together. And there was energy and excitement in the group. There was a kind of bonding that happened. And the time to shine, the time to perform was right in front of you when a lead singer lost her voice. Or the starting quarterback breaks his wrist. Or the cleanup batter who's hitting 450 rolls his ankle as he's rounding first one day. Or the guy who has your group project on his computer is home with the flu and today's your day to present. Or, God forbid, your cookie order got lost in the scout office. 
<laughs> Have you ever had that experience where everything was right in front of you and suddenly something out of your control dashed your hopes on the rocks? I lift that up to you because I think that's what's going on here in this story of the transfiguration. As we ask this question, why was Jesus transfigured? What was this about? What are we to take away from this story that is presented to us by all of the synoptic Gospels? I think it's like that if we remember what happened right before this story that we heard today, it makes a little bit more sense. Just to remind you, the couple of chapters right before this event on the mountain, you remember Jesus took the disciples up to the Roman city of Philippi and he says to them, who do people say that I am? And they're guessing, oh, Elijah, our prophet, oh, you're a great miracle worker, you're, you're the man, you're going to overthrow the Romans, you're our new king. And then he looks at them and he says, but who do you say? You who have been walking with me and hearing me preach and watching great works come through me. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the son of the living God. Jesus says, shh. And he turns his face to Jerusalem and he walks them down the road from that Roman city. And they're now going to Jerusalem where he's going to confront the hypocrisy, and the leaders. And he's going to reveal to them once again the nature of this kingdom. He's been proclaiming the kingdom of generosity and mercy and inclusion and unity in God. That is about love over law. He's going to Jerusalem and he says to his disciples, his students, as they walk down this major Roman road, lined by trees that have crucified bodies on them, put there by the Romans who want to make darn sure there's no more uprisings, there's no more riots, there's no more challenges to their power. People crucified along the roads. And I won't go into any more graphic detail than that. But it was not a pretty sight. And he points to them. And he says to his disciples, if you follow me, be prepared to take up your cross every day because you will suffer. You're going to suffer at the hands of those who resist me, who resist my message, who resist God's good works in this world, who resist having their comfort taken from them. You will suffer. And Peter says, oh no, Jesus, that can't be the way it turns out. Jesus says, oh, more than that, Peter, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be killed there. Just like the other prophets who have come before us, they will kill me. And you can imagine the disciples at that point, not only is Peter's rebuke, no, that can't be the way it is, Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, I made you a rock, not that I might stumble over you, but that you might be the path that others follow. Get behind me. Remember, who is the leader here? Who's the teacher, Peter? And the disciples at this point are filled with dismay and chaos. They're, they're wondering, is this what I signed on for? Did I really give myself over to suffering? To go to Jerusalem? To maybe even die? Is that what I Agreed to? Jesus looks at them and sees their hearts. So he says, Peter, James, John, who represent all of the people at that point who were filled with chaos and fear and doubt, he says, come with me. Come with me up the mountain. Why up a mountain? Because for a people who believed that God is out there, totally separate, a mountain was as close as they could get to communing with that God out there. We saw in our first reading with Moses. It is where people went to commune with their God. And so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. 
And we're told that when they get to the top of the mountain, Jesus is transfigured before them. Why? Because in the face of their doubt, in the face of their confusion, as they ask Jesus, if you're going to die, who are we then? Who's going to be our leader? Who's going who's to teach us? Who's going to be our master? Who's going to free us from this oppression? He is transfigured before them. The glory of God, the power of God, the Shekinah of God shines through His being. And they are forever changed. As they hear the voice from heaven say, This is my beloved Son, whom I love. I'm well pleased with Him. Listen to Him. I claim Him. I name Him. He is clearly my Son. You can trust Him. You can follow Him. Put your faith in Him. Listen to Him. They fall on their faces. And Jesus touches them. He says, don't be afraid. We can do this together. We can do this together. And Peter, I love it, Peter responds like a fisherman. He responds like most of us would have. Jesus, this is awesome. Can we just stay here? I'll I'll build us a church. I'll build us a church to honor Elijah and Moses because clearly you are the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Clearly, all of the trajectory of history is happening here now on this mountain. Why wouldn't we stay here? Forget about the suffering, Jesus. They'll get the message eventually. We can stay here. Jesus says, oh, Peter, don't you realize our destiny is in Jerusalem. The kingdom needs to be fulfilled in Jerusalem that all people might know the glory of God that you have experienced here. And they follow him off the mountain. Where Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody. Why? Because if they told people, you know what would happen. They would come and make him king. They would try to raise up an army at that point. They would change his whole trajectory. No. Keep it to yourselves until you see the fulfillment of this mystery. And so... The transfiguration happens clearly for the disciples to bolster them in the midst of their doubt and their fear. We need that sometimes too, don't we? You know, there's a whole second part to this. It hasn't let go of me over the past week as I've been thinking about, you know, last week when Pastor Steve was up here doing that diagram, that ancient image, that idea that God is up here And we're down here. And there's this layer or ladder that gets between us and God. And he said this statement. God is perfect. God expects us to be perfect. I don't know about you, but I was paralyzed with perfection. Took me straight back to my childhood because that was the message that I grew up with. God is perfect, and if you're not perfect, you're not worthy. And Steve proclaimed clearly to us that the love of God poured through that cross that Jesus went to in Jerusalem. But it occurred to me, this story of the transfiguration happens before the cross. This is a story for you and me. Because Jesus is revealing to his disciples and to us what it means to live in that power even before we have professed anything about the cross. The cross becomes the final exclamation point of the love that was shining through Jesus that day on the mountain. Think about it. The glory of God shining through his human body transfigured, one like us, transfigured by the power of God. What was Jesus proclaiming that day? We can live in that power. 
to climb mountains together, to fast and to pray together, to be in communion with our God together, to let that power of God shine through us as we surrender ourselves, our whole beings to God. Because see, whatever we say about Jesus, we can say about ourselves. Fully human, he was transfigured in the glory of God. It reminds me of the statement that St. Irenaeus said in 153 AD, that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. There's your image of a human being fully alive, transfigured by the power of God's love. Jesus was inviting his disciples into that life, into that mystery, into that fullness of being fully alive because we are not fully alive as individuals. We are fully alive as the body of Christ, as a communion of those who are baptized in his name. See, perfection isn't found in us as individuals. That's the mythology of our Western culture. No, perfection, wholeness, holiness, balance. That's found in the community that is the body of Christ. It is found in the faith community where transformation and transfiguration truly happens. We are Christ's second coming today. You and I Because of our presence in the world, transfigure and transform the world in the name of our God. Jesus showed us and invited us to be fully alive today that the glory of God might be known by those who encounter us today. How do we do that? By listening to Him. Listening to Him to the Word, resounding in our hearts and in our community, leading us to climb mountains and to be in communion, to be generous, to live with the law and the prophets as fully and lovingly as we can by paying attention to the prophets in our midst today who reveal God's Word to us. We are Christ's second coming today. Let us be nourished at this table to be that body fully alive.